Well, not too long ago, one of my children came to me with a sketch of what looked like a blueprint of their bathroom. And uh, I took a closer inspection as they showed this to me, and there were a few significant modifications to the bathroom. And I said, what is this? And the child said, this is how I would like to remodel our bathroom. <laughs> I'm thinking, where in the world did you get this harebrained idea of how your father needs to spend his next $30,000 that's surely just laying around? Hometown, that's where. And the Fixer Upper. Have you guys ever seen any of these shows? Raise your hand if you like the Fixer Upper shows. Anybody? Yeah. My, my wife and kids love these shows. Now, I'll tell you, I consider these shows dangerous. <laughs> they present new ideas. But, but they love these shows, and millions of Americans, Americans love these shows. And, and, and I think the reason is simple. When you look at that before and after photo, and you've got like, what was maybe weeks, if not months, of deliberation and planning and sketching and drawing and purchasing and, you know, tearing down and crafting and all of this stuff. And, and it's presented in this neat little segment in this beautiful and stunning before and after photo. It inspires you, doesn't it? Change is possible. <laughs> it inspires you and it makes you want to start drawing on sketch pads and spending money. Well, uh, Something like that is what the Apostle Paul has in mind in Ephesians 2. As he presents us with a before and after photo, he wants to inspire us that change is possible. And he's going to present us with a, a snapshot of our lives B.C., before Christ, and then our lives after Christ by grace entered in and interrupted our story, and holding these two pictures up, he's going to want to, and God wants to, inspire us to believe that change is possible. And since that's Paul's message, it's our message too, and I believe what God wants to communicate to us, he wants you to believe in your life change is possible, not just for old bathrooms, but old habits and old lifestyles, and old attitudes, and mindsets. He wants you to be able to set those aside and to walk in the newness that Christ has already purchased for you. And so we're going to present that photo for you in one of the most famous passages in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll be. We're in a series. We're in a series called Family of God. And this uh, message is one about transformation. What does it look like for us to be transformed as children of God into the likeness of our heavenly father so that we might be a chip off the old block so to speak right how can we look more like him in our daily lives so if you're here and you feel stuck in that old mindset you feel stuck in that old lifestyle that old habit today's passage is for you Ephesians 2 1 to 10 here's what it says it says, and you were dead in, trans in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us, who, uh, toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you can begin to see there's a 
contrast running throughout this passage, and it's especially captured in in a pair of words, one uh, set in verse 3 and another in verse 5. In verse 3, it's by nature. In verse 5, it's by grace. And so Paul is going to contrast these two realities. What were you by nature? What are you by grace? What were you by nature? What are you by grace? And that's the before and after snapshot meant to inspire us to want to live out this life change and help us fulfill those New Year's resolutions. So, uh, so we're going to start with what we were by nature. Okay, this is uh, to, to come back to the before and after, uh, to go like, uh, you know, you've seen, you know, seen this on Facebook. You see like, you know, the black and white photo and the tubby belly. This is what I look like. This is how I look now. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I'm going to depress you for a little while. We're going to go black and white photo. I'm going to tell you about this side of things. All right? What was it like before by nature? Three words, dead, enslaved, condemned. Dead, enslaved, condemned. So let's start. By nature, we were dead. We see this in verse 1. It says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What does it mean to be dead in your trespasses and sins? All right. Any of you ever seen the movie Weekend at Bernie's before? <laughs> Anyone ever see that? It was a very wholesome movie. <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. So uh, two guys, their wealthy boss dies. His name's Bernie. And they end up pretending his dead body, his corpse, is alive so they can mooch off his wealth for a little while. I'm telling you, it's very wholesome. Okay. So pre-Christ, you and I... We're Bernie. <laughs> we looked alive on the outside, but in, actually, in actuality, we were dead. We were spiritually dead, dead in our trespasses and sins, and just like a corpse has no responsiveness to God, just like a corpse, as it says in Romans 3, none who seek after God left to ourselves, we were corpse-like. There was no God desire in us. It wasn't until grace comes, and we'll get to that momentarily, but we were dead. To be dead in your trespasses and sins is to be 100% unresponsive to God. That was our position pre-Christ. We were burning. <laughs> Apart from grace and by nature, this was the state of every human from Adolf Hitler to Mother Teresa, everybody was under the condition of dead in sins. If you've not been spiritually resurrected, you are spiritually dead. That's the reality. And I hope that if you're here today and you've not been spiritually resurrected, you've not been made alive in Christ, that today would be that day, that God would be so merciful as to use my mouth to entreat you and implore you to give your life to Jesus, to trust in him for forgiveness and new life, that grace might interrupt your story. And if that's happening, grace has already interrupted your story. May that happen today. By nature, we were dead. Now, I want to um, put another image in your mind. And you're like, thank God, besides Bernie. But I want you to think about a log, a dead piece of wood, driftwood, just floating down the river. This is another picture of what it looks like to be dead in sin, okay? Just like driftwood doesn't swim one way or another, it just goes with the current. When you and I were dead in sin, unresponsive to God, we were 100% responsive to, 100% enslaved to the current of anti-God forces, and that brings up our Next one here, by nature we were not just dead, we were also enslaved to the anti-God forces that exist in creation, and there are three of those anti-God forces. You could think of them as just different currents in the river. They're all going the same direction away from Jesus. They're all going in the same direction, and everyone who's dead in sin is enslaved to them perfectly, 
Uh, but those three forces that appear in verses 2 and 3 are in this order, the world, the devil, and the flesh. The world, the devil, and the flesh. The world appears in verse 2. It says, you follow the course of this world. So before Jesus, mentally, we were all subject to whatever the world thought about the world, we thought about the world. So you take all the isms that are out there, whether it be tribalism or postmodernism or materialism or hedonism or fanaticism, this is the way the world is, and that's the way we were pre-Christ. We went with it. And it's not just mindsets, it's also feelings. You guys have heard me talk about, hey, you know, we've all got to be careful, we've got to be sober-minded, because we live in an age of outrage. That's why we have all this strife and division. Everybody's shaking their fists, you're terrible and I hate you, you know, everybody's doing that, and sadly it's happening so much in the church, just as well throughout America, but hey. If I live in an age of outrage, and I've not been made alive in Christ, then I'm going to be outraged. And if everybody's afraid and worried of everything and anything that might happen, that's the spirit of the age, I'll be that way too, because I'm driftwood. I have no power to fight against it. I might not be every ism, but I'll be some of those isms, and they're taking me away from God. The ways of this world, Paul says, everybody, everybody walked in them. So next, the devil, that's also in verse 2. He's called here, interestingly, the prince of the power of the air. That word air could be uh, translated as foggy atmosphere or foggy darkness. It speaks of this, the realm of darkness that he oversees. Uh, and, and that word prince, why is the devil called a prince? Because if you're not submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are submitted to a different Lord, you are submitted to a different master. The devil is a prince in that he oversees and rules over everybody who has not trusted Christ. And there's nobody in this world that doesn't fall in one of those camps, either going with Jesus or going with the devil. He is the prince of the power of the air. He gets a hold in a human heart. And then through that human heart spreads his evil into families, entire nations, even churches. He does his work. And, and you know, I, lo- I know we live in a, in a worldview that's uh, steeped in rationalism. We don't believe in that supernatural stuff. The devil, he's a symbol of evil. But I can tell you, the devil doesn't mind you not believing in him. He's actually completely cool with it. <laughs> he can do his work all the more. The more you don't believe in him, (laughs) okay? But he is the prince of the power of the air. He's the devil, and his fingerprints are everywhere you look. Last of all, we have the flesh. This is, we get to verse 3. He says, you lived in the passions of your flesh. And I think this is something that we charismatic folk who believe in all that prophecy and healing stuff, because we need to hear this about the flesh, because for us, you know, everything's the devil's fault. Oh, yeah, I'm going to cast, my car broke down, cast a demon out of that engine, (laughs) right? Like, everything's the devil. But, hey, you know, according to the scripture, like, and just my own life experience, right? Like, I don't actually need the devil to screw my life up that bad. Like, I'm perfectly capable of that. And so the devil comes in, and he inflames, and he exacerbates, and he manipulates, but my own flesh is perfectly wicked in and of itself, (laughs) Some versions will call the flesh the sinful nature, and, uh, and that's a good, uh, a good translation for it because it, it captures uh, what Paul's trying to say here is that, and he'll use this word in the same verse, verse 3, by nature. This is just the way that we are, and so you can think this is the disposition um, towards self and choosing self over God and over others. That's what the sinful nature does. Uh, you might think of it as your inner toddler. You ever had to teach a toddler to be obsessed with himself? Did you? No, you didn't. They were that way, actually, even before they were toddlers. I mean, they came out of the room screaming, pay attention to me! (laughs) 
And it's just, I feel like that deserved more laughter. <laughs> and so from day one, we're born with this self-obsessed nature. And, and I can imagine there might be somebody in the room who's saying, well, but Michael, we're born that way and we start that way. But when we get older, we kind of grow out of that. Like, you know, people are generally good when they get older and more refined and so on. Refined, yes, outwardly. But again, back to you parents who've had toddlers. Uh, you ever had picture day? You dress them up. You get the dirt out of the fingernails. You put them in the little stool or whatever it is that they're sitting on. And you say, okay, cheese. cheese. Okay, come on. And you're behind the cameraman doing this number right here. And 142 pictures later, you find one where your toddler is doing this. <laughs> and you send it to all your friends, and they're like, man, their kids always smile for pictures. Come on. We all know they're completely just as self-obsessed. All they did was dress themselves up. And it's the same with our flesh. It's the same with our sinful nature, okay? We all have an inner toddler, okay? It's just when we get older, we realize things like, you know what? Self-gratification isn't going to get me a good job. I have to delay gratification, right? And so we, we realize this, and so we, we maybe replace self-gratification with self-righteousness. We look good amongst our friends and church and so on. Maybe we replace self-hatred and self-pity that just put us in this pit of going nowhere and we replace them with self-adulation and self-love and you know these will actually get us going places and so when we get older we dress up the toddler but it's the same toddler it's still the flesh it just smiled for the picture and made the world go ah that you know i'll use myself that michael he's not so wicked after all <laughs> uh, you guys need to laugh more And so what we do is we dress up the toddler, the world, the flesh, the devil, by nature and apart from grace, we are as dead as driftwood, enslaved to the currents that are in this world, in this age. So last of all, we have by nature, we are condemned. And that is this wood that's going somewhere, well, eventually it's going to hit like a waterfall or something. There's actually a, a destination if nothing changes. And it's the same with us. If we just keep on drifting down that river, and again, I would appeal to anybody who's not trusted in Jesus that today would be that day, but if we just keep drifting, there's a consequence, and that's addressed in verse 3 when he says, uh, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this is our very nature, what we were born with. Now, I understand that to modern ears, the idea of divine wrath is uncomfortable. But the reason it's uncomfortable is that we have wrong understandings of what divine wrath is, as though it is God, you know, flying off the handle, God with a bad temper. I promise you it's not that. His very name in scripture is him who is slow to anger and abounding in love, okay? If that's his name, no, that can't be what wrath is. Quite the opposite, wrath is actually the perfect complement to love. Just think about it. If God perfectly loved you and infinitely loved you, he would have to be passionately opposed that all, uh, to all that stood in the way between you and him, right? So, you know, in the modern world, we want to get rid of God's wrath. No, God's love, God's love. But I'll, I'll tell you if, you, if you only want God's love, you have to have God's wrath. If you want to get rid of God's wrath, you might as well get rid of God's love because there are two sides of the coin. For God to passionately love you, he must passionately oppose all that stands in the way of him and you. That's what wrath is. And so here's, here's maybe... Uh, kind of fuller definition of wrath. Wrath is God's passionate opposition to evil and his refusal to compromise with it. Dead 
enslaved, condemned. Fun time. Now, I know for some of us, it might be hard to imagine because we live in this culture that constantly insists in the inherent goodness of humanity, despite the evidence of turning on the news, but we insist in the inherent goodness of humanity. Well, so we're, we're just, we, people at, at heart are good. This is just the air we breathe. It's, it's a little bit like that old uh, story where it's like you had... Uh, two fishes swim in one way, and you had a f- another fish come in the other way, and, and this fish says, hey, fellas, how's the water? And one of the fish says, what the heck is water? When you live in a worldview and in a culture, when you're in that river, you need one who transcends it to tell you the true nature of it, because you think it's all good here. <laughs> Inherently, we think we're good, a- and we see this manifest in a number of ways, but but here's what comes to mind uh, for me, okay? Let's take uh, the LGBTQ movement. Now, before I say anything else about this, let me just say this. I have very good friends who are presently in that movement. Everything I say is rooted in deep and profound affection for all who are in that. And in fact, heartbreak over the fact that I think church throughout history has maybe done a bad job at showing uh, people within this uh, movement the love of Christ. So that actually breaks my heart. So everything I say comes with that context. I'll also say that, that what's happened in contemporary church is because this is the water that we're just in, this is just the air that we breathe, this going with the current can tend to infect even churches, and a lot of churches have said, well, in order to love LGBTQ, I have to say that everything's okay, and actually redefine what's like a painfully obvious biblical ethic over and over and over again in the scripture. And so that's what, that's what we've done, and that's, that's what I refuse to do, okay? I refuse to do that because that would be the least loving thing to do, to tell somebody you're okay when it's, when it's not okay, to tell somebody that what the first three verses of Ephesians 2, they may be true of everyone else, but not you, like, wait, what? The very foundation of the LGBTQ argument as it redefines the sexual ethic, the very foundation of it is, I was born this way. I was born this way so I can act this way. In other words, whatever's natural to me That is what is ethical for me. Now, in light of Ephesians 2, let's think about how much sense that makes. Naturally, what are we? (laughs) Dead, enslaved, and condemned. Let me tell you something. Nature is not a guidebook for how to live. It is a guidebook for how not to live. And I think Christians go about it the wrong way when we're like, oh, you you weren't born this way and you chose it and all this. Now, I think a conversation can be had over that and and there are things to be said, but I, I think we're actually starting in the wrong place. The right place is that nature is not the guidebook anyway. It actually doesn't matter. It's actually irrelevant to defining what is ethical. Besides, there are very many clear statements in Scripture about what is ethical. Even besides that, the Scripture clearly states what we naturally are. And and, and guys, I have so many evil impulses from my heart all the time. It's just like me living those out. What's ethical? No. No. We need somebody who transcends, who's far above human nature, outside of the water in which we fishies swim, to tell us the nature of the things that are influencing and the currents that are pulling us. Nature is not a guidebook for how to live, but grace is. And I think people overlook this. We think about the grace that saved us, but do you ever think about the grace that teaches you? Titus 2.12, grace has appeared to us and it taught us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, which Paul defines as an evil age, okay? And so grace actually teaches us. Let's talk about grace now, because here's the reality. If I tell you you're, you're already good and all's pretty good, like, you know what? 
you, you were bench pressing and you got it up to here and you just needed Jesus to do this, to give you a little spot and you finished it off, how much does that magnify God? Not at all. You see the, the repeated line here, so that no one may boast. We saw in Ephesians 1, we're for the praise of his glory. The one who does the work gets the glory, and he does the work and purchased grace for us on the cross. That's why I love verse 4, because you start to get re- depressed in verse 3. We're like, oh, Lord, is it this bad? Yes. But verse 4, but God, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even as we were dead in our transgressions. Even if we were objects of wrath, guess what? God found something to love in us. He loved us so much that he poured that love out in the form of his own blood on the cross when he came and he gave his life for us on Calvary. So just as um, by nature uh, we have certain characteristics, by grace we have certain uh, characteristics that, uh, that are different. So let me put it like this. Instead of being dead, by grace we are alive. Instead of being enslaved, by grace we are enthroned. And instead of being condemned, by grace we are saved. Alive, enthroned, saved. All of these are the reality when grace interrupts your story So let's talk about them, beginning with, by grace we are alive. Verse 5, we were dead in our trespasses and made alive together with Christ. Now here's what boggles my mind. What boggles my mind is I tend to think that Christ's resurrection produces a benefit in my life. Well, certainly it does. (laughs) It certainly does that. But Ephesians 2 God says, actually, Michael, you're thinking too small. The resurrection doesn't just produce a benefit in your life. Resurrection is something you participate in with Christ. (laughs) You've been made alive together with Christ. This is an event which if you're a Christian, you've already participated in. If you're a Christian, you who were dead in sin have been made alive spiritually. He's made you alive on the inside just as God the Son was made alive on the inside of his tomb. His reality became your reality spiritually. And one day it will be your total reality when Jesus comes back and gives us new bodies and a whole new world to live in that is perfectly good. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? So by grace we are alive on the inside, which means we don't have to float like uh, driftwood. Having been made alive, we can swim against the current For a child of God, for a child of God, change is possible. By grace we are alive, and it gets better, folks. By grace we are enthroned. We are enthroned. That's when we get to verse 6. And it's interesting. It says, uh, not only did he make us alive, but he raised us up. So here, he's not talking about resurrection, because he already talked about that. We were dead, and he made us alive raised us up. I want you to picture Jesus after preaching for 40 days as a risen Savior. (laughs) After that, he rises up into the heavens, and they're like just watching Jesus fly into the clouds. This is called the ascension of Jesus. We just quoted it in the Apostles' Creed. And then Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. But what do we see right here in Ephesians 2? Now it's not just Jesus. We are actually participating in the event of his ascension and his what's called session, his being seated at the Father's right hand. Christ's reality is your reality if you are in Christ. You've been not just made alive so you see new realities. Oh, this is how God sees the world. But you've actually been raised up, exalted, and ascended and sat down at the Father's right hand, in the heavenly realms, it says, so spiritually speaking. You say, what does this really mean to me? If you were here last week, or even if you weren't, I'll I'll just kind of explain this very quickly. But I think it's in verse 20 of chapter 1. Do you remember when we saw Christ's ascension last week? Okay, so it talks about God's power being evident in the way that he overcame the two great forces that no human can overcome on his own. And what are those two great forces, death and evil? Well, Jesus overcame death 
through resurrection, and he overcame evil through his ascension, where it says he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and the language, language is far above every power and authority and dominion and every name that can be named. And so Jesus' ascension is a picture of him rising above, conquering the spiritual forces of darkness. So this would be the prince of the power of the air. Jesus conquered him in his ascension, and according to Ephesians 2, so did you. You conquered him too. You were raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Once upon a time, Satan was your prince, but now Jesus is your Lord. Once upon a time, Satan was your prince, but now you're his boss. And you can tell him what to do and where to go and to leave you alone. Because to be seated at the right hand of God, for Jesus what it meant was victory, honor, and authority. It means those same three things for you. You are seated in the position, spiritually speaking, of victory. The battle's already been won. By cross, you just got, or by Jesus on the cross, now you just got to live it out. So the battle's already been won. You have his victory, you have his honor, and you have his authority over the powers of darkness, spiritually speaking. No longer do you have to be enslaved to the forces of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Instead, you rise far above them, needing to be ruled by none of them, because alongside Jesus, you share in his authority. You're not enslaved, you're enthroned. And now here's the last one. By grace we are saved. By grace we are saved. It's repeated twice, once in verse 5 and again in verse 8. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to get a sip. So by grace you have been saved. Now, the question is, what is salvation? If you ask the average 10 Christians, what is salvation, they're going to tell you getting rescued from hell. Jesus came and he rescued us from hell. That is certainly salvation, but that is a sliver of salvation. If, the pie of, if there's a pie of salvation, like you just, you just got like a meager slice right there. Okay, I won't call it meager. It, it, hell's a big deal to be saved from. But I'm talking about in comparison with everything that is salvation, in context, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, do you remember? We weren't just condemned to wrath, we most certainly were, but we were also spiritually dead, we were also incapable of responding to God, we were also enslaved to these anti-God forces, well salvation includes all of that, now we're getting a few more slices in the pie, but there's still more pie, in fact a lot more pie, because if somebody's drowning and you rescue them from the water, for them to be saved doesn't just mean that they're not drowning anymore. It means that they get to live on land now, right? Like there's a whole new future for these people. Salvation is never a question of just what are you saved from, but what are you saved for? And so that's a fuller picture of what salvation is. And so, and so now what are we saved for? I'm going to read verse 10 to you one more time because Paul answers that question. He says, for we are his workmanship. That's a word that could be translated as masterpiece. Okay, I, I think there's some people in this room that like you might need to say that over yourself 10 times a day for the next week. You're walking around with a dark cloud over your head as though you're condemned. You're not. You're saved. And you are God's master." Peace. You might need to speak that over yourself. So where is masterpiece? Paul uses the word workmanship, same thing. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's the deal. Salvation is not just rescue, it's recreation. Salvation is not just rescue, it's recreation. He says, you have been created in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? When he says it that way, he's not talking about your first creation when you were born of your mom, okay? 
He's talking about your second creation, when you were born of God, when you were born into God's family. You were created once, but then you were recreated in Christ Jesus, no longer subject to your inner toddler and all these other forces, but rather recreated as God's masterpiece, custom-made, tailor-fit to fulfill God's purposes, which he prepared beforehand. Just think about that. Okay, we were all walking in the ways of this world, but God, before we were even born into this world, said, I have a purpose for your life. And he began to map it out for us. Well, once we're born again into God's family, created in Christ Jesus, we are now capable of living the new life. Not just saved from the old one, but able to walk in the new one. Not just rescue, but recreation made new. The language of Ephesians 4, made to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so God created you in his eyes, holy. And now our job is to live that out. In fact, you can kind of see in the, in the flow of verse 10, Paul chooses the word workmanship for a reason. We're his workmanship created to do good works. He makes a point. We're not saved for, uh, by good works, but we are saved for them. We are his workmanship created to do good works. What's the point here? This is how grace operates. God's work is what flows into our work. Our work doesn't start. If it's our work, all we're doing is dressing up a toddler for picture day. If it's God's work, then it's God who made me new on the inside and recreated me, called me a child of God so that now the message is not, you're bad, you're being a bad toddler, be better. Now the message is, you're a child of God, now just live it out. God's grace has worked in you, now just live it out. God's grace always comes first. We've been learning this for weeks. It began before the foundation of the world in the heart of God when he planned it. It came in time in the person of Jesus, and then it came by the Spirit as it worked in your heart, and God has continued to work his, uh, work his grace inside of you, and now we just have to work out what God worked inside. You say, well, how do I do that? And there's lots of things we could say, but I'll stick with the text and the message that it emphasizes. We do it by faith. We do it by faith. The same faith that saved us from condemnation. See, I think what we tend to do is we, we think like, okay, I, you know, I raised my hand at camp or I, you know, I got saved and that was, that was when grace by faith visited me. But the message here is that grace by faith is to be your whole life. Like this is everything. Like your whole journey, your friendship with God, the whole thing is living this out, even discovering your purpose. You're like, what is my purpose? Well, maybe the reason he hasn't told you is because you're to live by faith and to have a bias toward action and to actually take a step and do something. Nobody discovers their purpose on the couch. <laughs> you discover your purpose getting out and doing. And so this is part of what the journey of faith looks like, not just faith that saves me from condemnation, but from the devil and my inner toddler and saves me for my true purpose as a child of God within his family. And if I believe that I'm truly alive in Christ and have been enthroned with him and have been saved by him, the effect that it has upon me is I am no longer content to drift. And maybe this is a message for some of us in the room who've let ourselves drift, and it happens slowly. But when, when I really believe in the deepest parts of my being that I'm alive and enthroned and saved, what happens is that grace inspires us to believe that change is possible and then empowers us to live like that statement is actually true. I, I saw this when I was 19 years old, and I've been saved for about two years at this point. And I had one of those radical before and after, wow, Michael's so different. My friends were talking about it in the school. Everybody was talking about Michael's changed so much, and there's all these differences. And there were some major things and obvious things that dropped off in my life right away as soon as I fell in love with Jesus. But some other things that didn't. 
And a couple years into it, and I'm uh, at the University of Texas, and uh, I was dealing with some addiction and lust, and, uh, and as I was wrestling with this, I, I remember just kind of giving up and coming to the conclusion that in this area of your life, like, maybe this is just part of being 19 years old, right? I don't know, but this is an area of my life I cannot get control of, and I told myself that change is not possible, and what I discovered is it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because as long as I believed, and as long as you believe in your life, change is not possible, that itself is a, full, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I believed who I was by nature, but not who I was by grace. Sadly, this was reinforced in some of the circles that I was running in at the time, and um, it was frequently stated that, you know, we're wicked, where the, the phrase I remember was, we are worms in the dust. We're nothing more than worms. Now, you guys heard my assessment of human nature. I actually agree with that. I'm like, fine. Yes, we were very wicked. You know, worse than worms. Worms don't like rebel against God, but humans do, right? <laughs> so like, by nature, hey, I, I get it, but it was a matter of emphasis. Like, do we need to spend 90% of whether it be sermons or Bible studies or, you know, books I was reading at the time, whatever, talking about how wicked we are, or might there be some balance, like Paul shows here, yes, we were that by nature, but here's what we are by grace. And it wasn't until I believe in the deepest part of my being, and part of it came through an important friendship in my life, but where I really believed that these truths that we're talking about today were true, that I was alive and enthroned and saved for a purpose, that it was like I was born again again. And I saw myself as God saw me, and then grace empowered me to live out the reality of what was already worked inside of me. And I learned through that, that experience, that the reason change is possible is because it's already happened. By grace, maybe by nature, right, I'm one thing, but by grace, I'm not a worm. <laughs> and by grace, I'm not driftwood. By grace, I am a child of God, recreated in Christ Jesus to swim against the current of this world and help others do the same. I look forward to the day when Jesus comes back riding on the clouds and rescues us completely from this river that's raging quite mightily right now. <laughs> I look forward to that day. But there's a reason he hasn't rescued us from that completely and physically and totally yet. He started his work on the inside and then he left us here to fulfill the purpose that he marked out before the foundation of the world. So my encouragement to you is you're feeling the heaviness of that pull in the opposite direction is don't stop swimming. Convince the world with your life that change is possible by grace and through faith. Let's pray.